There we go. Excellent. Um, well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our U.S. Government Careers Panel. Um, I am excited for you to be here today with Celia and Michael. Um, we had a chance to catch up a little bit earlier this week, and I think you will be blown away with things that they have to, to say and offer to you today. Um, so before we get started on that, I, let me introduce myself. I'm Kristen. Um, and I am the North American Opportunities Manager um, with the Career Center, and I'm based in St. Andrews. Um, and so the Career Center and the U.S. Development Team have worked together to bring a number of these uh, panels to, to the interwebs, we'll say, over the past couple of weeks. So I also would love for the U.S. Development Team to introduce themselves. So if I get Leah to just come on um, to introduce her team. Can you see me and hear me? Sorry, a few technical difficulties. Um, yes, thank we you, can Kristen. hear you. And thank you, Michael and Celia, again. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I am Leah Dalton, and I'm the manager of alumni and family engagement for the United States. Um, and I work remotely from Maryland, along with three other colleagues who I think are with us on the call, um, and they're also based in the US. So we have Catherine Humphreys, who is our head of development for the US, and she's located just outside of Philadelphia. Lily Wen is our gift officer in California outside Los Angeles, um, and she covers the western half of the country. And then we have Moira Sharkey, who is also a gift officer based in Massachusetts, covering the eastern half of the country. So as a team, we work together to strengthen and engage our community of alumni, parents, students, and supporters in the US. Um, and we work to build our network through events like this, typically in person. But again, we've, we've had some great success with our virtual events. So thank you for joining us. Um, and I will add our contact details into the chat box and encourage you to reach out to any of us with questions or if you'd like to continue the conversation. So. Thanks again for joining us and, and back to our panelists. Excellent. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, so uh, you all showed up because you wanted to hear from these two very insightful people. So I am going to turn it over. Um, Celia and Michael, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your career, uh, what you've been up to and where you've gone. So Celia, can we start with you? Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here and you're just always a pleasure to uh, talk to St. Andrews graduates. Thank you. Um, so I graduated, gosh, in 1982, uh, thus making me the oldest person here, I'm sure. And my degree was in medieval and modern history. Um, I knew what I didn't want to do, teach or be an academic. Other than that, you know, it was um, sort of uncharted territory. And things were a little, com made a little more challenging because the economic situation in Britain at that time uh, was not that good. It was really tough to find sort of a job. So um, what I did was I was very fortunate. I had a U.S. work permit through my father, who was um, who worked for Cadbury's for many years, the chocolate makers, and had been recruited by a U.S. company. And I, while I was a student, got an, a green card. So I was going to go to California where my father was working, but I stopped in Washington on the way, Washington, D.C., because a professor from St. Andrews was uh, at the very beginning of sort of trying to set up a program to recruit U.S. students. Um, I guess the, the sort of I was in the vanguard of what we have today, which is really wonderful to see. Uh, and he needed a student to help promote St. Andrews. So I stopped on the way. So while I was in Washington, D.C., I found out about internships on Capitol Hill, and I went to intern, uh, volunteer, for a California congressman named Tom Lantos. I was very fortunate there because Tom was the only Holocaust survivor, a Hungarian, ever to serve in Congress. Um, so the fact that I was from England, no problem, you know, it didn't face him in the slightest that I had a, an unusual accent. Well. I did every job that nobody else wanted to do, worked all hours of the day and night, and they hired me as a staff assistant, and then I became a legislative assistant. And then I went down to work on his subcommittee to do housing issues. Um, and throughout this time, I was learning from everybody I worked with, from all the amazing resources up on the hill. And um, I learned sort of a bit about public affairs, handling 
press for, it was a big scandal in 1988, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and we oversaw that. Uh, well, after that, I moved over to work for another California Democrat, um, George Miller, doing natural, he was chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, um, did oversight for him. And then when the House switched in 1992, uh, I, I went to work for the Bureau of Land Management. That's an agency of the U.S. Department of the Interior. I joined their public affairs team. And in a couple of years, I became the uh, division chief of public affairs with a staff of about 12. Uh, well, after, I think, maybe 10 plus years of doing that job, I was recruited to become the assistant director for communications at BLM. And I oversaw congressional, regulatory, public affairs, and all external um, relationships, uh, which was a fantastic job. I loved it. Um, I did that for six years until I retired in 2015. And in my last position as assistant director for communications, I had probably 50, 60 people in my directorate. Uh, so I dedicated a lot of my time to personnel issues and hiring because it takes a long time and you've got to get it right. And I think over the course of my career, I probably hired about 75, something like that, people. And it was a very fun aspect of my job. I enjoyed it. And I think from this journey, I take a couple of things. First of all, um, public, public service was just fantastic. And I always felt, particularly for me as an immigrant, what a great privilege. And I had two big promotions, I would say. Well, when I became head of public affairs, that was under a democratic administration. But my really significant promotion was when I became the assistant director, a member of the um, senior management corps under the a Republican administration in a very sensitive position, communications, traditionally very, very political. And I came from the other party, quote, unquote. And I think what I took take from that was throughout my federal career, I always saw it as serving democracy and you do your job well and you do it to the best of your abilities. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I would take from it is I absolutely had some luck along the way, but I also made my own luck and making your own luck is so important in all of this. And I think that by that, I mean open to ideas, open to leaving the path that possibly you had in mind, uh, really focusing on relationships with people. Uh, you never know where they may lead. And above all, doing your homework. Every single step along the way, I learned from people, I read, I didn't have the resources of the internet till relatively late. For example, um, if you applied for a job at the Bureau of Land Management, um, Sure, of course, I'd expect you to look at all our social media sites and, and on the web, but I would also expect you to look at all the media coverage, very, very political agency, and get a sense of where we stand. So anyway, that sums up my career. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, beautiful, Celia. Thank you so much. I hope everyone is taking notes because that's a lot of knowledge right there. <laughs> um, thank you. Michael, over to you. I mean, that's tough to follow, Celia, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of hinge on one thing, Pu public service. I mean, it's, it, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to work with uh, military and civilians um, and on some of the most pressing issues that, that face the, you know, our democracy. So kind of looking into what a career means, right? It comes from the Latin to, to move at full speed, which is kind of ironic because a career is a length of time 25, 30, 35, 40 years, and you have kind of the, the dichotomy of those who are coming into the career, those who are kind of the middle, like me, and then those more experienced, like Celia. Um, but for folks who are looking into federal service for the career, you may have a plan, but things may change. Something may change it. So for me, um, I graduated in, from St. Andrews in 2003. I was the first post 9-11 class to graduate from St. Andrews. And I came to St. Andrews because I wanted to study international relations. Um, 2001 was the start of my senior year in college. I had it all planned out. I was going to go to law school. I was at a law fair like two weeks before the actual 9-11 attacks happened. The 9-11 attacks happened. And I remember our school came together and we had this question and answer session. And I just remember leaving it feeling very frustrated and very much kind of 
underwhelmed about the conversation that we had, went back to my dorm room, turned on the TV, and there was a professor from St. Andrews by the name of Paul Wilkinson. And he was kind of a distinguished gentleman. You know, there, he was being interviewed by CNN, BBC, every channel you can imagine. And I, just hearing him speak, it was, I want to do that. How can I go and do that? And it, it became kind of serendipitous because my friend, good buddy of mine, was at St. Andrews that semester before studying. So I had already visited him there. So I got, had kind of a lay of the land. Um, I applied and was accepted and ended up kind of beginning my career into the terrorism industry. So kind of backing up, I work for the Defense uh, Intelligence Agency. That, that's the U.S. Department of Defense Intelligence arm. What drove me throughout graduate school, through multiple degrees and following my doctorate and into public service was the question of what motivates terrorism? What would drive people to get into a plane and fly those into buildings? And that's a question that I have chased, am chasing, and will continue to chase for quite a while. Um, I ended up meandering a little bit. So my 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 career path is the, the Tolkien quote, not all who, those who wander are lost. So I, I've kind of done this. But each time I go back to the question of what motivations drive terrorism? What political facets give give birth to terrorism. And really, on a whim, I applied to the Defense Intelligence Agency after during my, my PhD um, dissertation and was invited to go do an interview. Um, Y'all will, will know that as much as Washington, D.C. is the kind of center of the universe for many things, the DOD has many arms outside of the D.C. area. So my first federal job was actually in Tampa, Florida. My first assignment was with U.S. Central Command, which is the operating arm overseeing two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. My first boss was a gentleman you may have heard of, General James Mattis, who was at that time the U.S. Central Commander, Commander then former Secretary of Defense. Um, an absolute brilliant strategic, uh, strategist, statistician, thinker. I mean, he was one of those, one of those guys that would call, call from the back row where, where I was at that time and point to you and say, hey, I want to know what, what you think. And that was actually my first four-star interaction with a senior military official. I'm in there backbenching, i.e. not supposed to be speaking, and I get called out on the floor. And it was a great conversation back and forth. So I did Central Command basically for about five and a half years. So I looked at all strategic terrorism issues from Al-Qaeda, to the Taliban, to the rise of the Islamic State. I deployed to Afghanistan for six months where I ran the insurgency shop looking at the Taliban um, in the summer of 2014. I actually saw the Islamic State kind of come up, bubble up in Afghanistan, watching what was going on in Iraq and thinking, wow, I'm really fortunate I'm in Afghanistan. I don't have to deal with that. Break, break. After I get back a week into my return leave, I get a call, hey, come back. We, you know, the new commander needs, you know, needs to be spun up on a few, a few things. So I've done the Islamic State for a while. And then at, in 2016, an opportunity opened up. So again, careers outside of DC. I work for now at US Africa Command, where I'm the division chief for all of the extremism, ex extremist groups in the uh, AFRICOM area of operations. So 53 countries, 15 extremist groups. That position opened up. It's something that I've always wanted to do because the Middle East is a very, it has a nice bridge to North Africa and the rest of Africa. And that's where I've been for the last four years. I live outside of Cambridge in the UK. I, I, love the, I love the job. I love the people. And going on to what Celia says, it's bringing in that next generation, that new blood, the new lifeblood and talent as what really is, is, trying, is motivating me to, to do this, this career you know, interaction with, some, with, uh, with the St. Andrews um, students. Wow. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, that I'm sitting here going, wow, um, so, so many fascinating parts and pieces of both of your stories. So yes, thank you. Um, perhaps the first question I'm going to ask is after your introductions, a really boring one, but I think an incredibly important one, because when we talk about federal jobs, working for the U.S. government, um, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is that application. So I'm wondering, can you give any advice um, and talk about the nuances of the application process? So what I'm thinking here is the federal resume, the application, the difference between different departments and agencies. What do students need to know about applying to, let's say, the DOD or the Bureau of Land Management or any of the many other departments and agencies? Either one can go first. Michael, I'll, I'll go in. I'll go first. So, so I think Celia actually mentioned it. Just do your homework. 
There are, so in my community, in the intelligence community, there are 17 different agencies. I work for the Defense Department. So our vacancy announcements are very much geared toward state on state, non state, conflict, intervention, terrorism, et cetera. So one of the things that I would highly recommend is when you're looking for those positions, print out the vacancy announcement. The federal vacancy announcements are very long, they're very wordy. So one of the things that you can do is take a look at that, start to underline, highlight, draw out some of the key words and key phrases, and make sure those things are in your resume. Because when you apply, your resume goes through a screening process. If those key words are not in the first screening process, it just gets omitted. You could be the best applicant, you could speak the most critical language that the US government desperately needs right now, but it won't matter if you don't have those, those knowledge, it's the KSAs and knowledge, the skills, and the abilities. If you have those things in there, then you're going to make it through the computer, and then you're probably going to get to Celia or myself as one of the hiring um, managers. Celia, I don't know if you want to add to that. that. That's a great way to sum it up. And something to remember in, in, in all of this is that um, something called, uh, if you're applying all sources from outside present government service, uh, veterans preference applies. Uh, which will give um, an automatic number of points to veterans um, applying to federal service. So that can make the bar quite high for non-veterans, and that's why you absolutely need to, you know, do your homework, uh, as Michael said. And even then, you may not make the cut. Um, and so a couple of ideas there. I mean, if you apply to some of the, you know, less you know, some sort of, quote interesting jobs. You know, which you know might be in Washington D.C. or the big urban centers. If you pl apply um, in the sort of rural West in the United States, you're going to have many fewer applicants for jobs, say in Needles, California. You know, Ely, Winnemucca, Nevada. And and I put this out there because all of you took a chance on going to St. Andrews. You went somewhere remote. Many of you may not have visited. And so think of this as maybe an adventure in a different way. Um, I'd also I'd say also that, that no, no, look at no, where the money is. Some is some is some Western, Western senators and both parties make sure the Forest Service and firefighting very, very well funded. So if you like the outdoors, that's a great way to get the foot, a, a foot in the door. Um, and that's Western wildlife firefighting. Um, the other thing to look at, uh, and we may talk about this later, is some of the programs that give you um, status, to, uh, non competitive status with the federal government, like Peace Corps, Teach for America, but possibly more on that later. Make your mics off, Kristen. <laughs> I said that. In another meeting the other day, where I feel like that is the new, um, I forgot the attach, like, please see attach, and then you forget the attachment in your email. Um, so, thank you. Um, is there anything students need to know about um, the resume specifically? Um, I know we talked about keywords or application. I think another thing that we had talked about stressing was um, that applying for. Bureau of Land Management is different than applying for the DOD. It's not one big entity necessarily, right? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 spot on. That's where the, the research into which agency you're applying mm -hmm. to and what kind of, so D DOD, you're gonna get a lot of international relations, political science, PPE, you know, geography, you're gonna get kind of that, those those students, but you're also gonna get some of the non non-traditional students that have, you know, Chemi yeah, biology, chemistry, et cetera. It's also trying to make that fit. So like for, for me, for instance, we were talking in our, in our prep call about, um, you know, kind of COVID-19 and the DOD response to that. Well, there was a front page article in the Washington Post on the National Center for Medical Intelligence. Not many people have heard of that, but it's where you have, you know, virologists, uh, biologists, chemists, et cetera, that have a very specific niche skill set that then come to do analysis for the Defense Department. And those folks have been complete heroes throughout the last six months because it's their specific you know, education and their ability to write that in such a way that a policymaker will be able to read and understand that, um, 
that has made this made made the difference. But going back to it, so for DoD specifically, it's keying in on what if you're going to go for you know Middle East or South Asia, it's drawing out those those things that start to pop at people, little blinking lights that say, hey, I've spent time in in Egypt. You know, I studied I studied at St Andrews as overseas. I've been you know I studied abroad in these places. It's kind of putting those things in there that not only get you through the first res or the first resume review about the computer, but then actually create a picture for the hiring manager to say, oh, that person seems really interesting. That person was a Peace Corps volunteer, you know, lived in you know, Southwest Asia or something like that. It, it's really painting that picture. So you're picking, you're picking the interest of the hiring manager to extend that offer for an interview. Absolutely, completely agree that um, everything that Michael said. And, you know, the federal resume, I think that everyone is probably trained to say, OK, your resume might, can't be any more than one page. Not true with the federal resume. You've just got to keep you know, hitting those keywords that are in the job announcement in your resume to echo it all back. It's sort of like trying, think of it as two sides of a coin or parts of a jigsaw puzzle that you're trying to make fit. Uh, and that, that's sort of the way to go into it. Um, and I know that um, uh, we have, I, I mentioned the programs earlier that gave you non-competitive access to um, uh, federal jobs, and I think there's a handout that uh, Chris that, that that we may have on, on related to them that lists them. Um, and one of the things, if you do come from uh, one of those programs, is informational interviews at any point are always good. But particularly if you're a graduate of one of those programs, because if I'm sitting at the Bureau of Land Management and I am desperately looking for somebody who likes to, you know, wrap it in the West a little bit. Uh, you know, is up for a bit of an adventure, who can write, who has an interest in sort of the landscape, natural resources, doesn't need to have a degree in it. And that person walks into my office and they'll return Peace Corps volunteer. They'll get a job because when I had, when I was assistant director and I had, you know, 50, 60 people, I never, ever had all my positions filled at any one time. It just didn't happen. It was such a struggle. You have to make sure you've got the money, you've got to advertise the job, you've got to make sure you can get in the queue with HR, et cetera, et cetera. It, it takes minimum six months to fill a position and then somebody else leaves. So if I can have a quick, easy hire with a smart person who walks into my office and I like, it's golden. And I, in my position, those are sort of the skills I was looking for, writing, also relationship skills, working in the federal government, you're part of a team and you're constantly learning from your colleagues uh, at all levels in the organization. And I consider myself so fortunate to have gone to the clear process. Yeah, amazing. On that note, I'm wondering if we can expand a little bit here on the purpose of networking within working in the federal government. Um, I think oftentimes people think, oh, well, I'm just going to be put in this big process anyway. And so does it even matter if I network? Um, can you talk a little bit about the purpose of networking and, and how that looks in the federal government? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give it a go. I think one advantage that that students have nowadays is you can go on LinkedIn and kind of surf around for profiles. So one of the things that I tell folks is find someone that has that has a job that you want. You know, take a look at that person, and you can kind of backwards, you know, deconstruct kind of where where they where they've come from. Um, that that's a big one. It's also if you have someone that knows someone and then can make that that introduction, just having someone inside the agency that can advocate for you it is massive. I mean, if if you're a known entity, a known quantity, and if you know, I work with Celia and Celia says, oh, I have person so and so and they're just they're the best, you know. It's not supposed to influence things. However, if I come with and candidates are equal on paper, they're equal kind of you know interview and someone comes with a recommendation from a colleague, those are the things that then push people over the edge. So, I mean, networking, I think is a good good sense to look at the jobs that are out there and look at the ones that you you know may or may not be interested in. Try to find that kind of in in those, I mean, those, you know, when, when I was in DC, it was going to the intelligence community had IC happy hours. So we, we would kind of pick a bar around the DC area and we'd go and we'd meet, it'd be a bunch of grad students, you know, MA or PhD or undergrad students. And we just talked to people, people that were, you know, five years or, or less in federal service or people that had over, over 20 years. So it was just having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction, getting the business card and then keeping in contact because, you know, having someone that can, 
take a look at your resume, you know, as a kind of a mentor or coach can really pay the dividends when you apply for your first position because you've got someone who's able to say, hey, this, this looks good or no, I would fix these few things and kind of you know, provide pointers. But that networking component is, is pretty big. I'll second that. I can absolutely confirm that I would meet with people, uh, you know, who just come for informational interviews and then I'd try and hire them, you know, if I could. And it happens all the time in federal service because as a manager, you want to have people who are smarter and have different talents from the ones that you do because it's going to make your job so much easier. And I was always, always the way that. Um, you know, Michael mentioned LinkedIn. What a great resource these days because you can find out people if people went to St Andrews, and that's an immediate, you know, um, you know, foot 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 in the door. Um, so. Um, you know, I, th I think information interviews are also very valuable because they give you a sense of the culture of an agency, you know, gives you a sense of whether this is a place you want to work. Um, very valuable. And just the more people you know, I mean, my, my son you know, told me the whistling Vivaldi, apparently 85% quotes, 85% of Americans get their jobs through somebody they know or an acquaintance or another friend. So networking, very important. Yeah, and I want to pile on for one comment that Celia made is uh, agency culture. It, it's big. It's different. It's one of those things where talking to people, you get a sense as to, I like that or no, nah, not so much my cup of tea. I mean, that, that bit is really big because there's there's so many options and, you know, in the federal, federal government. So, you know, yes, you want to get your foot in the door. That That's great. But also be discerning in terms of where you want to go, because when you get in there, you get kind of sucked in and you're in this, you're in this track and now you're just you're going and you're going. And if you like your job, if you're in the agency where everything fits and everything clicks and you have good good peers, good counterparts, good supervisors, good managers, then I mean, then you've just you've hit the jackpot. Yeah. And I would just jump in too, just a, a thought I have. You know, be very careful what you post on social media um, because, you know, before I had anybody, uh, I'd, you know, one of my staff would go and check somebody's social media accounts. And um, for me, it went to judgment. Um, and in fact, I made a decision not to hire somebody um, once because uh, uh, the candidate uh, who was leading candidate sent me an email inquiring status with what I felt was a highly inappropriate picture attached of the candidate. Uh, did not display good professional judgment in my regard and so much of communications in my business was about judgment and can't yeah so a story <laughs> and yeah. it goes past <laughs> yeah no th that's a great story um and i think it is something to be aware of that um social media can be used in hiring processes and to help make decisions so i think that's Certainly important. Michael, I, I, well, I know that both of you are super involved in hiring, uh, but Michael made a comment in our, our call earlier. Um, I am wondering if you can tell us how many, when you have a, a position open, um, let's say more of an entry level, something that a, a recent graduate would be applying for, how many applications do you get for that? Thousands. We get thousands of applicants. I mean, g going from the federal scale, and, and you'll learn into it, a GS-7 is kind of your out of college, you know, entry level, GS-9 if you have a, a master's degree or maybe higher. And uh, we had a number of positions that we posted openly because you can hire internally through the agency and you can hire externally. The external hires for one of our GS-7s, we got 2,500 applications. And this is not meant to, to scare you or frighten you or, or, or anything like that. It just gives you a sense as to the raw kind of competition that's out there. And then from that 2,700, the computer whittles it down to a couple hundred. And then between the hiring panel, which usually consists of four people, the hiring manager and, th and three others, then that they get to go through. And actually, I mean, I had a resume stack, you know, that thick with a binder and we're flipping through stuff, flipping through, you know, and you know, some, some of the um, what's used to determine suitability sometimes is, hey, there's a glaring error on the resume. OK, next. You know, oh, they misspelled this. Next. So it, it's 
you know, the resume is, is very important. Put put the time into it. Get it, you know, like tight, very tight. Because once you get once you get that, then if it tells the story of you as an applicant, then you're going to attract the attention of the hiring manager. But the competition is stiff. Mm -hmm. I think BLM was um, a little more of an obscure federal agency, so we weren't quite in your league, but we certainly got a good number of applicants. And, um, you know, if, this is five years ago, so things were a little different uh, economically. Um, although I, I would say that, you know, the, the, the more, the less well known the agency, you may stand a better chance. And you know, one example is if you're interested in, in international affairs, I think everybody thinks immediately, oh, Department of State, it all happens there. And there are so many other agencies that you should be looking at where there might not be quite the same level of interest, you know, commerce, um, trade representatives office. And I think that pretty well every US department and many of their agencies they will have some kind of international program. I know the BLM actually did. So, so. Yeah, amazing. Um, Celia, I'm actually going to keep it to you. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more. You mentioned it earlier, but we had a good discussion about hiring in times of crisis and that actually um, it might be a bit backwards than what we would think. Uh, when it comes to the U.S. government. Can you say more about that? What happens in the U.S. government when there maybe is a crisis, such as well, economic recession? Um, so I, I think it's important here to pay attention to the political side of things. Um, the bills approved by Congress so far have been um, relief bills, you know, directly direct appropriations, checks to the you know, U.S. taxpayer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there is considerable discussion to recovery um, uh, stimulus um, money being passed by Congress. Uh, particularly if there is a change of administration, we will see significant investment, I would say, in the, in the federal government. When President Obama came into office, a somewhat similar situation, and he had the stimulus um, legislation, which was... Uh, Every federal, you know, federal agency got to spend money as an investment for the Bureau of Land Management. We expanded greatly into renewable energy, and that was sort of the genesis of the current program and really sort of kicked things off uh, for a shift in energy and energy consumption. Um, so follow the money is always my advice. I mentioned earlier Western senators are very interested always in wildland fire uh, prevention forest spending, um, and I would also look at things like the Student Conservation Corps. They will probably have investment. I don't know if they have the non-competitive conversion to federal jobs. They might. I'm certainly not an expert on that, but it gives you a sense of federal service in an outdoor arena. Um, an agency you've probably never heard of, the Department of Interior, that will always be well-funded is the Bureau of Reclamation. Why? It's responsible for all those dams out west, bad things happen if a dam doesn't get maintenance, infrastructure service, etc., etc. Hoover, and it's about electricity to the west. So there's kind of uh, a whole slew of western policies um, that drive the money from a very powerful um, block, Democrat and Republican, of western senators who are tremendously influential politically. Yeah, great. Thank you. So for all of our, uh, everyone on the call, I just want to let you know, I'm going to ask one more question um, of our panelists, and then I'm going to turn it over to you all. So if you can start thinking of what kinds of questions would you like to ask our panelists? Um, so my, my, my last question to you is, what, um, how do students leverage the fact that they went to St. Andrews in their application process and in their careers? Um, in the federal government? I mean, I'll, I'll take, a, take the first stab at it. I mean, a couple things. So number one, you're graduating into a global alumni base. I mean, that's, it's pretty awesome. When you look at the Guardian, the, the rankings, I mean, I sent it to my friends and said, hey, look, look who's number two. Like we're, we're sneaking, we're breaking the Oxbridge kind of one, two, you know, one, two punch. So I kind of, you know, like, like to poke fun at that. Um, but also too is in, in, even in my cadre of folks that came out of St. Andrews in 2003, 
you know, you have senior executives, you have senior, you know, managers to to force our generals, you have people that work on the Hill, you have people that work in the Pentagon. I mean, you have a very deep and broad alumni base from which to to contact and to learn from. Um, so that's I mean that that's great. In terms of leveraging it in your your resume, yes, put it on there. Put your interests. Put what you've done. Put any languages. Put you know what what types of stuff you know what kind of courses you've taken to kind of draw out the fact that what St Andrews provides is a you know top notch international education, and and that will that will start to sparkle for the hiring managers. Great, thanks. And and I would add to that. One of the huge benefits of St Andrews is everybody has heard of it. Everybody. Mm. An unbelievable global reputation. And I, I would put it up against pretty well any other British university. Um, uh, and that's just a fantastic asset because it opens doors. Mm. Um, and I think what it also says, if you've applied to St Andrews and you've, you've, you know, you've, you've gone there, you're willing to take a bit of a risk, you know? You're willing to go overseas. You're willing to go to a place where you couldn't just come home for the weekend. A different system from the one that's more traditionally followed in the in the United States. So you're open-minded, um, open to opportunities, and sort of returning to, to to what I said earlier. So much, and to what Michael said, so much of developing a career is being open to opportunities. And the opportunity is coming in the most unexpected ways mm -hmm. um, and being open to them and never, n never closing that door. I mean, I would never have thought, you know, if somebody had said to me when I, in 1982, oh, you're going to end up as, you know, a senior manager in this, you know, obscure but politically, you know, very important federal agency in the United States. I would have said, you've got to be joking. But I came here. It was just one thing after another that being open to those opportunities. And I think the fact that you've gone to St. Andrews says you can do that in that way. Yeah, great. Thank you both. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, to our audience here, um, to our students. So if you have questions, um, feel free to either put it in the meeting chat or you can feel free to raise your hand and um, I'll call on you. There's a raise hand function um, kind of in the lower part of your screen. So first question that has come in, um, do you prefer to see federal resumes created in the USA job builder or, uh, sorry, how would you, oops, there's a Seymour, hang on. How would you like to see applicants including freelance work experience without regular hours in a federal resume? So two different questions. I'm not sure that is I, I that is a good answer to that the right answer to that. Um, I don't know a whole lot about USA Job Builder, but you do need to get that freelance experience in there. That is important experience and yeah. says a lot about you. Um, I when I was hiring, and I recognize now it's almost five years. It's it is five years ago, so things have changed a lot in that time. The resumes that I saw, if they had jobs on them that were not, you know, professional internships, but were more sort of working in restaurants, working as, um, you know, the janitorial staff, um, I always liked that. And the reason I liked that was because it showed that that person could get on with other people. And that was something I was very interested in. They could build relationships with others who weren't necessarily like them in a diverse community. And that was very significant. So I'm not sure that's the answer because I'm really not familiar with USA Job Builder, but I liked personally seeing that experience, but others may, may, may differ. Yeah, I would just say put all that in there. I mean, the resume builder is, is a very big investment of time, but it's one that you should definitely spend doing because it, that will become your your resume to go to the federal agencies, and it's you can do it both ways. You can build it in USA Jobs, or you can build it, you know, on on your own. Just be sure that you follow the template um, that's close to the the USA Jobs resume. After you get in, you can do whatever you want. 
this is just to get you through the wickets to get you into to get your foot into the door and also be aware that a lot of other agencies so for dod for example they they use usa jobs but they actually will make you apply at a different website so like for, for my agency for instance it's dia.mil if you go into usa jobs and you see a position for the defense intelligence agency you need to go to it'll redirect you to da.mil and it'll get, make you do a whole another resume build into that one so just just be aware of that right um some something i would add to that i i suspect that hr might like usa jobs because they're familiar with it but i have no basis for saying that so is it easy using you using your usa job builder does it make it easier for hr to find those keywords because they're accustomed to seeing it i don't know right excellent thank you um okay next question that has come in is uh, which agencies would be most most realistic for an undergraduate to apply for who is passionate about environmental and uh, animal rights activism, interested in the EPA, but not sure how realistic it is for an undergraduate? Well, you could always look at the Bureau of Land Management, Wild Horse and Burrow Program. That has got more media ink than many, many other PLM issues. <laughs> Managing all the animals out west, uh, very controversial. Um, definitely an animal rights component in there, um, but I would suggest uh, spending some time out west and getting to know the issue a little bit. Um, it's uh, certainly sort of the third rail of the BLM um, and always just a, a, a media challenge. Um, and any of the Department of Inter DOI agencies they all have um, a, a sort of um, biology component, if you like. Um, I mean, endangered species over at Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, National Park Service, obviously. Many of them will be interested in uh, probably a scientific degree of some kind. Um, so those are just a, a couple, of, couple of ideas. Yeah, great. Um, all right, next question is, can you give some tips on how to do informational interviews, how to ask for them? Um, is it more of an interview style or more of an informal chat? And are there any questions that you think are best to ask? Um, I, I, I can jump in there. Um, I think that when you sort of approach somebody about an informational interview, first of all, make clear it's informational. You're not asking for a job. That takes the pressure off almost immediately because, you know, the more senior you you rise in the uh, in, in sort of government, I personally found the more open people were to um, meeting the, you know, up and coming generation because it was a certain responsibility that comes with it. Um, I always try to meet with anybody who asks me for a meeting. I would say um, getting a phone call was always great. I, I, okay, this is five years ago. I'm old. Uh, I'm sure there are other ways, an email that can be lost in the email, you know, whatever. Um, and I always thought somebody had the, you know, the courage to pick up the phone and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm uh, graduating from a degree in. Would, would you have a few moments just to talk with me? And I'd always say, oh, let's go get a cup of coffee, bring your resume, I can't promise you anything. Well, I, you know, a couple of those people I actually hired because I stumbled upon the fact that they were uh, returned to Miracle. So, um, and let me just leap off at a quick segue, uh, tangent there. Watch a Miracle program because there is a chance with uh, a changing administration that there might be significant expansion of it. Um, to do tracking, tracing, tracking COVID coronavirus related work. And for the next year after AmeriCorps, you would have status to get a government job non-competitively. And if you do one of these programs, and I think they're all listed in the handout, don't delay because the federal government hiring process takes a long time, so. Yeah, I'll also just quickly jump in. Before, sorry, Michael. Um, so Celia just mentioned a handout. I'm actually gonna have Leah just upload that to the meeting chat. Um, so Celia and Michael put together a really amazing handout with tons of great information 
in it just for you to reference. Um, so take a look at that. Lee's going to upload it. Um, and again, you could just download it off of the meeting chat um, from there. So thank you both for pulling that together. Um, but yes, Michael, anything about informational interviews? Yeah, I mean, the, the questions come, come with your questions. I mean, it's like, like Celia said, it's cup of coffee conversation. And this gives you a chance to talk to someone inside. So, ha you know, ask those questions. What's the most frustrating part of the job? What's the most rewarding part of the job? Like, what's the day to day routine like? Because, again, it gives you a sense as to could you see yourself in in that position, in that agency? I mean, the, even even when you get into an interview, like I'll tell you what one of the just kind of on a sidebar about interviews. One of the questions that I like to ask to our, to our applicants is kind of turn it around and say, you know, as an interview question, what questions do you have of us? And it, it throws people for a loop because they, they're not expecting it. And they say, wait a minute, you're, you're asking me questions, but I'm being interviewed. And it, it goes back to doing your homework. Really think about what those thoughtful questions are that you really want to know, you know. Is it stressful? Is it is it a dynamic work environment? What's the biggest challenge you face? Where does the agent where do you see the agency going in the next kind of three to five years? Like don't don't be afraid. I mean, for me, it's having the applicant that shows a little temerity and courage to to bring up something that may be, you know, maybe a hot button issue, but can they're 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 willing to ask it. I mean, that, that speaks volumes to the hiring manager. So, something I would add too, and this, you know, in the you know, interview process, you know, if when you are doing it, like, and I think this is any job interview, you know, popular question, I'm not necessarily fond of it, is, you know, you know, are you a leader or follower? And people always want to say, oh, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. Well, the most thoughtful response I ever had when she got the job was a lady who said, I think I'm both. Um, it's very important to be able to follow direction, and but also to take a leadership role when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And remember that the federal government is about taking orders. I mean, there is, you're following a process, you're following direction. Yes, there's a time for leadership, um, but you've also, it's really important to be a good follower. And I think that is a hugely underrated skill. Great, fantastic, thank you. The next question that came in is is for Michael. Um, so, Michael, can you elaborate on the process for finding an entry level position within DIA? Um, it was my impression that entry level positions with that agency are not advertised online, but rather filled during in person job fairs. It's both. It's both. So one of the one of the things that, and great question. One of the things about DIA is that the way that the agency is now moving moving to hire is they'll have these big big interview. Um, informational sessions where you will apply, you'll send your resume, and then you'll get invited. And then when you come in, it's, you know, you, can, you get to kind of walk around and, and there's hiring managers, there's prospective employees, you give your resume, and then once your resume goes into a bank, and if you apply for a certain position and you go through the wickets, you will be hired in, in um, during that some of those, like the one that I did almost 10 years ago, was one where I went and actually walked out with, with a, a job offer. Those, those do happen. They are, they are more frequent because the agency is trying to move more quickly. So what, one, one point that Celia mentioned that is worth bearing in mind for, at least for us, if you work in anywhere in the intelligence community, is that the federal process is slow for, for positions. It's more so... It's slower with the IC because you have to go in through a security background check. So depending on where you've lived, a lot of other things, it could take another six months. But that said, it's go, it's going through those that those steps that will you know get you in get, get, get you get you in the clearance and then into the position. So yeah, go to the go to dia.mil, look for the hiring fairs, and then also look for internships because you can do those as an undergraduate or a graduate student, and those are really the ones where if you live in the DC area or other hubs around where, and DIA has got a bunch of them. So Tampa or Collins, Colorado, you know, Omaha, there's a bunch of different ones that you could go and look. If you, even though you go to school in St. Andrews, if you're around any of those areas, you can apply to be a local intern. And those have really good prospects of conversion from intern to federal service. I'm certainly no intelligence expert, but one thing I would say um, is watch for opportunities where agencies have direct hiring authority. They are 
hard to fill jobs where you need a lot of people very quickly. And OPM does on occasion grant that um, in areas. And those are just fantastic because the manager wants to get that person on board as soon as possible. Uh, and certainly at BLM, we would occasionally do it in the Department of the Interior. Great. Fantastic. All right. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. Any more questions from from our audience here? All right. Um, oh, there is one hand that has been raised. And um, I lost it. I'm sorry. Who? Oh, um, Alessandra, if you want to come on and ask your question. Me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to know if you two um, were to go back to um, maybe 10 years ago or before you kind of started in your current career trajectory, I was just wondering if you guys would um, would have taken a different path at any point or um, would have considered going a different route at any point, if that makes sense. <laughs> It does. It's a very philosophical question. It's a great one. I mean, I think a lot of it too is you have a plan. Serendipity kind of happens. You apply for things and your career kind of starts, starts to go. I, I'm speaking for me. I love my job. I love the people that I work with. I mean, we get to deal with, from my optic as an international relations nerd, we get to deal with all these really interesting, fascinating issues on a day-to-day -day basis that you know, get reported up to the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, even to the President. So, from my optic, I, I, I'm I, I'm loving where where I am right now, especially especially right at this moment in time, because I'm talking to the new generation, the new blood, and trying to you know coax you, you know, lure you, however you want to call it, into an agency that desperately needs you know think thinkers, they need leaders, they need followers, they need team players. They need all these things that help make the the bigger apparatus of the DOD function. So for me, absolutely no regrets. I I am completely happy where you know where my career path has taken. Would I do things differently, kind of in, in hindsight? Maybe. But as Celia said, think, things happen for reasons. Opportunities are there. You know, be comfortable in the fact that you can go out there and seize them. And then along the way, find your your Celia's and other people that are your mentors that you can then bounce questions off of and those folks help you gap, navigate the uh, sometimes choppy waters to the career. As a long way of saying, no, I I fell into my career in, in a certain way and I'm very thankful for it. Yeah, I, I have moments, um, sometimes when I, I come back to England a lot, um, middle of time there, my family's there, I sort of think would have, could have, should have, you know. But I, I, I'm so grateful for the experience that I've, I've had um, I had opportunities on the way to make different choices and I certainly had the opportunity to come back to Britain and I chose not to and this country has been very, very good to me. And I, I think to sort of circle back to a point that Michael made, you know, liking your job, you know, I've always loved what I've done, you know, I've had fun. It's been intellectually stimulating, great people, rewarding, interesting always, always learning something. And sure, I've had bad days, we all do. If you don't, you know, it's not life. Um, and I think that that has always sustained me and I, I've been so grateful to have had the opportunities. Maybe I'd have done some fine tuning on the edges looking back at it, but you know, you make your own luck and this is where we are. Amazing. Okay, um, we have a, a couple more questions, if that's okay for for you both. Um, fantastic. So, um, the first one is: any thoughts on reporting disability? Um, maybe I could jump in here. Um, not sure uh, exactly the context of the question, but there is an important um, hiring component: disability hires in the federal government, and again, that's non-competitive. Uh, we have a little bit more information on that in the handout. I did um, a few disability hires and again, loved it because quick, easy hire um, and uh, great people. And um, 
One of them is now a very senior um, legal lady at the Department of Interior. And the other one is uh, doing great things in Denver for the Bureau of Land Management. So. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I mean, absolutely. Um, the one the one thing to be cognizant of it is if you're kind of a pure civilian without any military experience, is be sure you're following the protocol and how you you report the disability. Other than that, you're, you're good to go. I mean, for for DoD from for my field is we hire a lot of you know military that have disabilities as well. But I mean, it's it, absolutely listed if it falls within the guidelines and the rules and regulations. For sure, put it on there. Right. Thank you. Um, a bit of a fun question here. Um, what are you both reading right now? Well, I'm going to betray my roots, and I have just finished a biography of Samuel Pepys, the noted diarist. Um, I'm a historian, I guess, at heart, and uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it. And I want to go and to the Pepys Library when it's open at Cambridge, uh, perhaps when I visit uh, my niece who lives in, strangely enough, Peterborough. <laughs> Amazing. Small down world the, here. Right down the road. Um, yeah, so my guilty pleasure is the Saxon series by Bernard Cornwell because, you know, the, the, the history of England fascinates me and he's a phenomenal historical fiction writer. So, I mean, top notch. My, my other nerdy book is A Distant Mirror. It's uh, a 14th century kind of expose into Europe and um, just the crazy 14th century life. So that and the other random kind of, I've got an Al-Shabaab book on my bed that I just put away because it's, it, yeah, it's not, not fun to read at night. I can imagine not. And I can also do that, uh, add to that, I read the paper. Uh, yes, I'm very old fashioned, I take hard copy. I also read it online. Really, really important. I think in life generally to know what's going on around you. Don't get your news from new media platforms. Get it from um, uh, a sort of journalistic source. Yeah, and and that, that's a great that's a great question because you know one of the things that I look for is intellectual curiosity. So that's yes. a question that I actually ask in in my interviews, and it stumbles people because it's like, what do you mean reading? After I'm reading because I'm in school. It's like, no, no, no. Well, what do you read for fun? What what do you read when you don't have to read? What are those things that you go to? And then... that, that's so funny because I also used to ask that question all the time. And, you know, when somebody said, or oh, I'm reading obscure English poetry, I loved it. Amazing. So last question we have for you here is, can you give some tips on how to tell a story on your resume? Yes. Um, be succinct. So be short, be succinct, be brilliant, right? I mean, it's the one of the one of the killers are the resumes that come in at 15 or 16 pages that make the reader wade through things. So, you know, you're not reading like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, you, you know, you want to get really to the heart of it really quickly. So and you can do that. You, you can be you can be you can be clear, you can be succinct, you can be brilliant, you can be brief. So there's actually a book called Writing in Brief. Um, I'm totally blanking on the author now, but I'll, I'll pass it to y'all. But it's got some great tips in there about how, how to do that. And, and really, it's, it's showing that thread, showing the, you know, the interest that you have, showing that you, know, you worked you know, night shift to make ends meet, to do, you know, so you could go to school or like showing those things around there because I mean, it shows grit. It shows determination. So um, a long way of saying make the resume interesting, make sure it's nice and crisp and succinct and you know to, to the point so don't don't drone on but get that get that clear message out there and be sure that you're you know you're telling it absolutely make it easier for the reviewer the reviewer does not have a lot of time and you've got to present those nuggets as concisely as possible and just like michael said i would always look for things that were a little different a little offbeat uh, I'm looking for resilience, somebody who can survive in difficult, situ you know, difficult situations. And, you know, that can be done by working in um, a sort of non-professional job, you know, with um, in a different environment. So any of those experiences are, are useful. And I, 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 I always found those very telling about a person's character because they were willing to roll up their sleeves and do whatever it took. And I think that so much looking back on my history i got my i made my own luck if you like by mm -hmm. doing the jobs that weren't necessarily 
the fun jobs people didn't want to do. Oh, I don't want to be there at four in the morning to do X. And I, 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 I would do that, um, you know, to get the proofs, the galley proofs back from the printer so you could go through them before the document was published and you did the press conference, all of that stuff. So it's it's been willing, always willing. Yeah, I would make one just one follow up to that one is that make the story interesting in your resume and then make the story interesting when you tell it in person. Mm -hmm. that, that's the that's the deal. Remember that the resume gets you in into the door and then, you know, then you've got this this component that's happening right now that you're probably going to be doing because of, you know, COVID-19 where you're doing this with an interview panel, you know, local or um, internationally gl globally. So make sure that story is consistent, consistent, consistent from the resume and then also presented in the interview. Excellent. That was amazing. Thank you both so much. So we are coming up, well, we've passed the end of our time, but this has been such an amazing conversation that we just wanted to get in a few more, more questions. Um, so the last thing I'll say is one of the things that both Celia and Michael talked about is um, the power of networking and using the St. Andrews community. Um, LinkedIn was put in there, but also I think when we think a little bit more broader about our St. Andrews community, um, we want to direct you towards St. Connect. And if you haven't been to St. Connect yet, I would really encourage all of you to, to join and be on. It's our global online St. Andrews community. Um, and it's where you have the chance to interact specifically with St. Andrews alumni and other students. Um, so I would really encourage you to be on there um, again to help with that networking piece and getting to know the St. Andrews community. Um, so with that said, I just want to thank you both so much for your time and your wisdom and your energy. Um, there's been so much good stuff that's been said here today. And I know that I'm taking away things. I bet every single person on here is as well. So thank you all so much. Really appreciate um, you being on our panel today. Thank you so much. Um, for great. Yep. Excellent. Happy all right. Thanks so much. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.